Symmetries, whether they are space-time or internal, global or local, continuous or discrete, are incredibly crucial to the study of physics. They not only make solving problems simpler, but their intimate connection to conservation laws can guide us towards theories of nature based on conserved quantities we observe. I've talked quite a bit in my standard model series about the importance of symmetries to our understanding of our universe. However, just as interesting, if not more, than symmetries themselves is what happens when a symmetry is broken. What exactly does it mean for a symmetry to be broken? We can see one example of this by considering a circle, which is symmetric under any rotations about its center in that if we make any such rotation, the circle will look the same. Now, if we make some deformation to the circle, it will no longer have the symmetry. If we make a rotation about the same point as before, the new shape will not look like the same shape as before the rotation. Such a case where we change the physical properties of the system so that a symmetry no longer exists is known as explicit symmetry breaking. Now, while explicit symmetry breaking is very important, we will be more concerned in this video with a different way that symmetry is broken. Let's start by saying that we're standing on top of a hill. We will say that this hill is shaped so that everything looks the same whether we look to the left or if we look to the right. In other words, this hill is symmetric under reflection, or more mathematically speaking, it has a Z2 symmetry. Now, say that while we're at the top of the hill appreciating the nice symmetrical view, we lose our footing and tumble down to the bottom of the hill. Once our head clears from the fall, we try to look side to side again, and we notice something startling. We no longer see the symmetry under reflections. The symmetry still has been broken, but this time in a more subtle way. Nothing about the hill actually changed, and if we climbed back up to the top of the hill, we would see the reflection symmetry again. But from where we are viewing the hill, we can't see the symmetry. This case, where the underlying physics, the hill in this case, features some symmetry, but a particular system that we look at, such as standing at the bottom of the hill, doesn't respect this symmetry, is known as spontaneous symmetry breaking. This is the key difference. When a symmetry is explicitly broken, we are changing the actual physics so that the symmetry is never respected by any given system. If we change the shape of the hill in some arbitrary way, then no matter where we look at it, it will never have reflection symmetry. Another fantastic example of spontaneous symmetry breaking is given by Steven Weinberg in his wonderful series on quantum field theory. If we think about a collection of atoms, the equations which explain each atom individually respect rotational symmetry. However, we can build objects, such as a chair in Weinberg's example, which do not respect this symmetry. The equations describing the atoms are always rotationally symmetric, but the solution to the equations we are looking at, Weinberg's chair, is not. Therefore, we would say that the symmetry of the equations is spontaneously broken by the solution we are looking at. So, what does this have to do with particle physics and masses? Before we get into this, we have to understand a few things about field theory. First and foremost, every quantum field has a certain energy associated with it. And more importantly for this context, each field has a vacuum state, which is the state of minimum energy. The important situation we will be interested in is when our theory does not have a single possible vacuum state, but several. In more technical terms, we would say that the vacua of the theory are degenerate. The case of degenerate vacua is special due to the fact that it guarantees that we have a spontaneously broken symmetry. We can see this since if the two vacua have the same energy, which is necessary in order for them to be degenerate, they will look exactly the same. Therefore, the theory must be symmetric under any transformation which takes us from one vacuum state to another. However, the actual physics of the theory can only happen in one of the possible vacua, and so one must be chosen over the others. This act of choosing a preferred point in an otherwise symmetric system is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. The next thing we need to understand before getting into specific examples is that in the theories where we have a well-defined concept of particles, namely weakly coupled theories, the state with zero particles in it does not necessarily have to align with the vacuum state of least energy. 
In fact, the zero particle state is somewhat arbitrary, and we can often choose the value that it takes, whereas the lowest energy state is a physical property of the system. What we define to be a particle is a fluctuation about this zero particle state that we choose for the field, which means that different choices lead to different definitions of particles. The field will always prefer to be in its lowest energy vacuum state, but if we are working with a theory where the zero particle state and the vacuum state are not the same, then we can expect the vacuum state to be full of particles. This is due to the fact that we need to accumulate some number of fluctuations, or particles, in order to shift the zero particle state into the vacuum state. This offset can be described by a vacuum expectation value, or VEV. We can think of a VEV as describing the likelihood of observing a particle popping into existence out of the vacuum. So, if our field has a non-zero vacuum expectation value, that signifies that we have a misalignment between the zero particle state and the vacuum state. Let's look at some examples of how this all comes together in practice. The energy of the zero particle state can be described as a function of the VEV, known as the potential. So, say that we have a potential which looks like this. This potential is symmetric under reflections about the zero VEV point, and so if we choose our zero particle state to be at this point, this state will share the same symmetry. In this case, the zero particle state is also the vacuum state, since it lives at the point of minimum energy. Therefore, we only have a single vacuum state, and so the symmetry will not be spontaneously broken. We can also note that fluctuations about the vacuum raise the energy of the state, meaning that particles arising from such a potential will be massive. Now, we will change our potential to one which is still symmetric under reflections about the zero VEV point, but now has two degenerate minimum energy vacua. So if we choose our zero particle state to be at the symmetric point, these vacua must live at some non-zero value of the VEV. However, the physical vacuum state can only be in one of the two vacua, meaning that one of the values of the VEV will be chosen over the other, and the symmetry will be spontaneously broken. From this example, we can already get an idea of how particles can gain masses from spontaneously broken symmetries. Say that we have two fields that we will call phi and psi, which interact with each other. If we assume that the potential describing phi looks like the example we just considered, we know that there will be a reflection symmetry that is spontaneously broken. Let's also assume that psi does not spontaneously break any symmetries, and that it's massless when we're working at the reflection symmetric zero particle state for phi. In this state, we know that phi will obtain a non-zero VEV, and if we recall, that means that the preferred vacuum state for phi will be full of particles. Since psi and phi can interact, when we have a psi particle moving through space, then it will constantly be interacting with these phi particles filling up the vacuum. In some sense, these interactions weigh down psi, and the net result is that psi behaves exactly as we would expect from a massive particle. Another way of seeing this is using the fact that we're allowed to shift phi so that its zero particle state aligns with its vacuum. This is convenient because the new definition of phi will no longer have a VEV, but we have to account for the fact that we've still shifted its value by a constant amount everywhere. Since psi interacts with phi, this constant shift will affect the behavior of psi, again giving it a mass. A good analogy here is throwing a ball in a pool full of some liquid. The ball will be slowed down by interactions with the liquid, and it will behave substantially differently than if we threw it in an empty pool. Different liquids, as well as different properties of the ball, will have different effects. For example, a denser liquid will slow the ball down more, but adding holes to the ball will allow more of the liquid to pass straight through it, and it won't interact as much. In this analogy, the fluid is the constant shift of the phi field, and the ball is a psi particle. We can think of the VEV of phi as the density of the fluid, since the more we have to shift phi to reach its vacuum from the symmetric zero particle state, the more stuff psi has to travel through in this vacuum state. The interaction strength, or coupling, between psi and phi 
we can think of as the number of holes drilled in the ball, since this determines how strongly this offset of phi will affect the dynamics of psi. Together, these two factors are what determines the mass of the particle psi, a larger value of the VEV of phi in the symmetric zero particle state, and a larger interaction between phi and psi will result in a larger mass for a psi particle once the symmetry is broken. No matter how we choose to look at it, we see that if we have a field which spontaneously breaks a symmetry by obtaining a VEV, any fields that are massless in the symmetric theory and interact with the field getting a VEV will produce massive particles once the symmetry is broken. This is known as the Higgs mechanism and plays a critical role in the standard model of particle physics. Okay, so now that we've seen the mechanism of generating masses through spontaneous symmetry breaking, we should look at a few more examples which give even more insight into what happens when a more general symmetry is spontaneously broken. First of all, we should note that the field which obtains a VEV can never transform under spacetime symmetries, otherwise these spacetime symmetries would also be spontaneously broken. From what we know, these symmetries are exact and unbroken in nature, so we don't want to concern ourselves with such complications. Such a field which doesn't change under spacetime transformations is known as a scalar field. Just because these scalar fields are unaffected by spacetime symmetries doesn't mean that they can't change under other internal transformations. As an example, let's look at the case where we have two scalar fields. Then, we can build a two-dimensional quote-unquote field space where each axis of the space is the value of the respective field. The potential of such a theory will depend on points in this field space. In this case, we'll say that the particular potential which describes our theory looks similar to the one in the previous example, but now in two dimensions. In this case, the potential is symmetric under rotations about the origin, which we will choose to be our zero particle state. We can also see that this zero particle state is not the vacuum state of the theory, and that our fields will obtain non-zero VEVs in general. Here our symmetry does not just exchange two points, but instead it smoothly rotates points in the space. This means that we no longer have just two degenerate vacua, but instead an infinite number of them. When the physical state chooses one of these vacua, it will spontaneously break the symmetry, and again we can shift our zero particle state to align with this physical vacuum state. But remember, we associate fluctuations around this vacuum state with particles. Since our field space is two-dimensional, we can fluctuate in two independent directions, one of which we can choose to be in the radial direction. Fluctuations in this direction will increase the energy of the state, which we already said means that the particles associated with such fluctuations will be massive. We can also fluctuate in the azimuthal direction, taking us from one vacuum state to another, not increasing the energy of the state at all. This means that the associated particles will be massless. This masslessness is directly tied to the fact that we have a symmetry which is broken. If the rotational symmetry never existed, then we wouldn't be able to go directly from one vacuum to another with just a small fluctuation. In other words, without a continuous symmetry, these particles would be massive. This is in fact true in general. For every continuous symmetry, which is spontaneously broken, we end up with a massless scalar field, known as a Nambu-Goldstone boson, or often just a Goldstone boson for short. Another interesting feature of spontaneous symmetry breaking is that not all of the symmetries of the theory are always broken. To see how this works, let's consider a similar example again, but now in three field space dimensions. The generalization of the potential we considered previously will have three rotational symmetries, one rotation about each field space axis. The possible vacua of the theory now make up a sphere, and this symmetry will be spontaneously broken when the physical vacuum state picks out a point on this sphere. Since the sphere of possible vacua is a two-dimensional surface, fluctuations along the surface will give us two massless Goldstone bosons, and fluctuations in the radial direction will give us a single type of massive scalar particle. 
Remember though, we get one goldstone boson from each spontaneously broken continuous symmetry. We began with three continuous symmetries, but we only have two goldstone bosons, meaning that one symmetry was not broken. To see this, think of a vector pointing from the origin of the field space to the point on the sphere representing the physical vacuum. Notice that this setup still has a continuous symmetry under rotations around this vector. So one of our three symmetries has survived the breaking, and the other two are encoded in the goldstone bosons. Everything checks out just as it should. Now, there is a final aspect of spontaneous symmetry breaking that should be discussed. When the broken symmetry is a local symmetry instead of global. If you've seen my video on symmetries and quantum electrodynamics, you know that the transformations associated with a local symmetry depend on where we are in spacetime. Not only that, but local symmetries also require the addition of extra fields, known as gauge fields, in order to maintain the symmetry. Here, there are a couple of subtleties which are important to the discussion, but aren't necessarily obvious without seeing the math work out explicitly. First, these gauge fields must transform like spacetime vectors, like the electromagnetic field, under spacetime transformations. And second, particles arising from these fields must be massless, otherwise the local symmetry is explicitly broken. We also know that these gauge fields have to interact with any other fields which transform under the local symmetry transformations. So if we have a set of scalar fields which are affected by such local transformations, the potential of these fields can be broken such that they obtain non-zero VEVs and the local symmetry will be spontaneously broken. Not only that, but since the gauge fields must interact with these scalar fields, since they transform under the symmetry transformations, the gauge fields must obtain a mass. This mass isn't a problem like it was before from a symmetry standpoint, since the symmetry is now broken, and so we don't care if we have further terms which break the symmetry. If you have taken a course in electricity and magnetism, you know that a massless vector field, like the electromagnetic field, has only two possible polarizations, each perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Massive vector fields, on the other hand, have a third possible polarization along the direction of propagation. This gives us a mismatch between the possible states in the symmetric theory, where the gauge fields have only two possible states, and in the spontaneously broken theory where the gauge fields have three possible states. The resolution to this is actually quite nice. Remember that for every local symmetry transformation, we have a corresponding gauge field. So for each spontaneously broken symmetry, one of these gauge fields becomes massive. The other thing to note is that these local symmetries are continuous, and we already saw that each spontaneously broken continuous symmetry gives us a goldstone boson. This means that we're always guaranteed to have the same number of massive gauge bosons as goldstone bosons. What happens is that the massive gauge bosons absorb or eat the goldstone bosons to obtain a third polarization state. So when we have a spontaneously broken local symmetry, the gauge bosons corresponding to the broken symmetries pick up a mass, and we end up with no physical goldstone bosons. The gauge bosons associated with any leftover unbroken symmetries will remain massless. Spontaneous symmetry breaking is a hugely important phenomenon in physics. In the standard model, it explains why particles such as the W and Z bosons have masses while other gauge bosons like the photon and gluon are massless. It's also used to explain the structure of low energy QCD where quarks are bound into hadrons. Now while this discussion has been very particle physics focused, mainly due to my personal understanding based on my background, this is not the only context in which spontaneous symmetry breaking plays a key role. In fact, many interesting theories in condensed matter physics, such as superconductivity, superfluidity, and ferromagnetism, necessitate the spontaneous breakdown of some symmetry. So we see that not only are symmetries extremely important to physics when they are exact, but many important physical phenomena also arise from symmetries that are broken.